general. Oh, yeah, there were some princess discriminations in class for this one. She was a general. What was her name? Regina Benjamin. Regina Benjamin was her name. Do you remember anything about her qualifications? Go, go ahead. Is this a male or Naomi? Oh, I was itching my neck. Okay, so okay, you're itching. I guess Emil is itching too. Anybody so. remember her? I do know. Go ahead. Wasn't she, didn't she win the MacArthur Genius? Yeah, she did. She got a MacArthur Genius Grant. She was the youngest female and youngest black doctor physician that was appointed to the American Medical Association. And do you remember something about how she practiced her medicine? I do agree. We'll say what now? She did house calls in rural Alabama. See, rural Alabama isn't always bad. Rural Alabama, and she would do them for free if people couldn't pay. What was the problem when she was nominated to be Surgeon General? Her appearance. And I, I gave you this as an example of sometimes how we judge the book by its cover kind of thing. Um, she is, what was the problem with her appearance? What was that? What was the problem with her appearance? She was, she was big, thank you, that, that's really, zoom, so get real, walk over there to him and zoom in. What, what, what was, what was the, give me a good word for her. Obese. Obese. And what's the significance of obesity? It's the number one problem. Number one health issue in the United States. The Republicans jumped on Regina Benjamin and they're like, hey, how can you have somebody that is visibly obese being the person who, in fact, is actually supposed to be fighting that health issue in the country. What was the counter argument to that, in addition to her qualifications and stuff? Go ahead, Pantrella, you want to, zoom in. Your weight isn't the only thing. I, I don't know, never mind. With Michelle Obama, because Michelle Obama was promoting healthy living. Michelle Obama was the real spokesperson for this, and they kept Regina Benjamin in the background, probably because of her appearance. But the thing was, well, they said several things on this. And I think the question I had asked y'all in a couple of occasions was, if your doctor tells you not to smoke and you decide you're not going to smoke and then you drive off and your doctor is smoking out back of the hospital, are you still not going to smoke? Maybe the Republicans have a point. Of course, the other argument is, you know, if you're a drug addiction counselor, you're a better counselor if you had been drug addicted. Maybe somebody who is fighting the fight would be a better representative as the Surgeon General. So, you know, there's a number of ways that you could go with this. Do you remember what the last thing was that they had suggested that might make her a really good Surgeon General? Yeah. What? Yeah, and I mentioned to y'all that idea of Oprah. When people watched Oprah's show, everybody lost weight. And when Oprah went off the diet, everybody gained it back kind of a thing. But it kind of makes her a little bit of a sideshow. And if you remember, we, we talked about Good Morning Australia, I think, right? How women judge women's appearances harsher than men do. And, and I, I mentioned to y'all this may not have actually been just about uh, pardon me, um, weight, but it may have actually been about gender because you don't hear guys getting judged upon their appearances the same way that, 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 that women do. So be, be looking at these. There's a lot of stuff that's in there. I know we're coming up on time. Um, going back to Congress, because we haven't done anything with Congress. Yes? Do we have to know the numbers for, that you listed for the House and Senate? Let's get into that really quick. What are the numbers that we talked about with the House and the Senate? I said at the beginning that one of the most important things that you need to know is going to be differences between the House and the Senate. And see, here's the thing on this. It's not just being able to list them, but it's, it's being able to tell me why on some of these. So I'm going to ask you for some differences between the House and the Senate. Make sure you can explain these because that's, that's kind of a big deal. Um, what are some of these these numbers or these these characteristics? Go ahead. It's, it's 435 people in the house because of this based on population. Yeah, based on which plan? Uh, which plan? Virginia, Virginia, Virginia plan. Based on the Virginia plan. A hundred in the Senate based upon equality two per state. That's the New Jersey plan. What about the terms? What about the residency? What about the ages? Go ahead. Uh, Twenty-five or older to go in. Uh, live in, uh, <laughs> in state for seven years. Okay. Uh, and they serve two terms. They serve two terms. And they get like mm -hmm. two years. Two years. Two year term. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay. Twenty-five years old. And and remember on this, 
The House of Representatives was the one branch that has always been popularly elected in American history. Senate and President, President to this day isn't popularly elected, the directly popularly elected. The Senate is now because of amendment, but the House always was. They made the House most responsive to the popular will, and the Senate is kind of the check on that. So you can be a minimum of 25. Why is the House age a little bit younger than the Senate age? Why is the residency requirement a little bit less? They have less of an influence. Okay, that's part of it. Go, go ahead, Gabriel. And you said because the Senate um, has more experience. Well, if you're older, they needed to, be, they needed to have more. Yeah, the Senate is probably considered the big brother or the big sister in this. The House, the little brother, the little sister, because of the powers that they have. And there was a sense you needed to be a little bit older, be a little bit more American, and be a, a, a little bit more experienced in order to do these things. Do you have to be born in the United States to be either in the House or the Senate? No. Yeah. no, you just have to live for a minimum of seven years, minimum of nine years in the Senate. Maybe the biggest difference of these is the terms. What is, and, and Lily started to butcher this with the terms, well, what is the difference between the terms between the House and the Senate? Go, go ahead, is this a male or Naomi? Maybe. Okay, just making sure. Um. <laughs> She's FaceTiming a male is, that's why we're... Yeah. yeah, she's not. She's on mute though, so she's not saying anything. She's just listening. She's probably saying stuff. She's just on mute. That's okay. All. Yeah. <laughs> um, two years for House and then six years for Senate, but every so every two years the entire House is reelected, and then every two years in Senate one third. Yeah, they they basically. Do you remember what Washington said about the difference between the House and Senate, George Washington? The coffee thing. The coffee thing. What's yeah. the coffee thing? So he said it's like the house or whatever order it is. He said it's like the saucer and the coffee. How you're like the house around. is like the saucer and the coffee. <laughs> Something like that. Wow. Go ahead, Daniel. Help me out. The Senate is the um, saucer and the house is the tea. coffee cup. And once now it's the tea. Okay, go <laughs> ahead. <laughs> okay. Anyways. The house is volatile, so and it spills. And when it spills into the saucer, it can cool down. That's where everything can calm down, and the Senate is a little bit slower in deciding, but it can do more research, per se. Yeah, yeah the, the Washington had said that the, the House was like the cup of coffee, and it was volatile, and it would spill over, the passions would, and the Senate was the saucer, and the coffee would spill over in the Senate, and what would happen in, in that saucer? It would cool down. The, the, the House at two years is responsive to the popular will. Hurry, hurry, get elected, get elected, introduce bills, get things passed, do a budget, then run for re-election. You're almost running for re-election as soon as you get there. The Senate, on the other hand, with six years, they have a tendency of slowing the process down. So it's almost like a tug of war. And, and the idea is the House is maybe going to make some mistakes. They're going to go too fast. They're not going to think things through. The Senate has a way of moderating that. And, and with the elections, while the entire House is going to be up for election every two years, a majority of the Senate every two years is not going to be up for election at all. So the Senate is going to change its politics. It's going to take two or three elections sometimes to change the majority from Democrat to Republican, Republican to Democrat. It changes every election sometimes in the House because of its, of its volatility. Do you remember the different rules or the different constituents? Because this is another kind of significant difference. That is right. And typically in the House, you're going to get two or three minutes to speak, whether it be in committee or on the floor. And even if you have a lot to say, you can't go beyond that unless somebody really is going to give you some of their time. And that is something that does happen. How is that different in the Senate, though? And what's filibuster? filibuster. How does the filibuster work? Uh, you just have to keep talking. You just have to keep talking. What can you talk about? Anything. <laughs> Anything at all. Go ahead. Narrow it down for me. Okay, I don't remember talking about the weather with shopping filibusters. Go, go ahead, what's that? The shopping list. Your grocery list. Milk, bread, the eggs, Bible. cigarettes. What's that? The Bible. The Bible. In the beginning, God <laughs> created the heavens and the earth. As long as you continue to read. And, and what was the third thing? And who was the person that, that, that we really talked about with this? Was it who? 
Strom Thurmond. How long did Strom Thurmond filibuster continuously? 24 hours. 24 hours and 18 minutes. And see, the thing about the filibuster is when you are given the microphone, you can talk as long as you want. However, you've got to continue to talk. And if you remember, I asked y'all, what was your longest phone conversation? And some of y'all got into this stuff. Well, we weren't talking, but we were FaceTiming. And we were sleeping, and I was like, no, 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 you got to keep talking. And remember, you need to drink something sometimes, or maybe you need to, to expel something sometimes. Well, you can't do that while you've got the microphone. you got to keep on talking. So he got up there for over 24 hours and talked and talked and talked and talked and talked, talked, talked against a, a civil rights bill. It passed, and did it hurt him that it passed that quickly no. once he got done? No, he actually got stronger because he did everything in, in his power. Why do people get upset about filibusters? Well, he did, sir, but why do people get upset about filibusters? Go ahead. Uh, because the faster it ends, well, they would end the bill faster. Yeah. They would end the bill faster. Or, no, they would, you can't leave. Yeah. You can't leave? The process takes longer. What do you mean the process takes longer? And the people are always arguing with you. It takes longer to pass. Well, it's even more basic than that. When you have control of the floor, no other Senate business can get done because you're holding up everything. You have control of the floor. So the longer that you talk, the more it pushes back other people's bills, other people's amendments, other people's votes, any of these other kinds of things. People get really mad. Excuse me, not just the party in power, but in fact the, the, the other members of your party, because it's the minority party that typically does the filibuster. And this is their way of slowing down or even stopping the process. Maddie, your square man. I was going to ask, can we go over Article 1, Section 9? Article 1, Section 9 deals with what? Limits of powers of Congress. Powers of Congress, yes. And, and if you remember... I wouldn't worry about enumerated and elastic, but the ones that I would really focus on up here are going to be treaties, appointments, and revenue bills. How do the treaties work? Do you remember? Who has the treaty power in Article 1, Section 8? Senate. Senate does. And what is that power? What's that? Yeah, the president, maybe the Secretary of State, maybe ambassadors and diplomats, somebody is going to negotiate a treaty. And even if there is an agreement between the United States and a foreign entity or multiple foreign entities, the fact is, is that the U.S. is not bound by it until the United States Senate says yes. And if they don't say yes, then the United States is never bound by it. I may not have mentioned this in the 9 o'clock class, but in, I think all the others I did. Um, when Woodrow Wilson was president, he was the one who really pushed the Treaty of Versailles to end World War I. He suffered a massive heart attack because he pushed this effort so much. But the United States Senate never ratified the peace treaty to World War I. This is 100 years now. Uh, and so the U.S. was never bound by it. That's part of the reason that World War II broke out. And, and Woodrow Wilson even said, hey, if y'all don't ratify this, in another 20 years, there's going to be another world war. This was 1918, 1919. The Germans got into Czechoslovakia, I think, in 1939. He was really close to this. Really, really close. So that's the piece on this treaty. What about appointments? Yeah, the president will nominate with the advice and consent of the Senate is the language in the Constitution. So the president nominates, and this could be Supreme Court justices, this could be federal judges, this could be cabinet members, this could be ambassadors, these kinds of things, ministers or public consuls. And the idea on this is, is that the president will nominate, and then you need a majority vote of the Senate in order to confirm. And for the most part, a lot of this is rubber stamp. But if it's a Supreme Court justice, because that's a different branch, they're much more significantly contested. Here's the thing. The House has no vote on treaties. The House has no vote on appointments. This is the Senate's power. And this is kind of a big reason why the Senate's qualifications are a little bit higher. They have a little bit more experience to kind of maybe think these things, think these things through. Go ahead, Gabriel. What did you say again the House can, can do? Or What's left? What's the power for the House with revenue it bills? It starts in the House. Yeah, there's an old phrase out there that says, if I'm going to a fight, I ain't waiting for the first punch. <laughs> the House is the one that can throw the first punch because all revenue bills have to originate in the House. Do you remember why? Something we kind of already talked about in a roundabout way. The House was the most responsive body to the popular will. 
and revenue bills, whether it's spending or taxes, are going to be dealing with money or property. So they wanted these to originate in the branch that, in fact, the people had the most direct control over because property was a pretty big deal back in those days. Still probably, probably is.